2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now when we went through 1 Thessalonians, I purposefully departed from the end of that letter to a different letter rather than continue on to 2 Thessalonians, namely because of chapter 2. Chapter 2 is a complicated chapter. It is a difficult chapter for interpretation. And as we will see, regardless of the difficulty, the message is bright and it is shining clear. Jesus will return. He will return for us, his people, and he will set things right as we prayed just a moment ago. So, Paul the Apostle, he writes to this church, as we have mentioned, a church that is very near and dear to his heart. A church that he spent about a month with before things erupted in the community and caused him to have to flee by night. This church has suffered. Uh, a man in this church named Jason was dragged out of his home. Apparently his home is where the Christians of Thessalonica would meet. And he was beaten within an inch of his life and sent back to the Christians to say, you watch out what you're doing or else you're going to end up just like Jason. So this is a church that knows what it means to suffer. It knows what it means to be troubled. And it knows what it means to face exterior threats. So often in our lives as Christians in the West and in America, our conflict tends to be with one another. We rarely have conflicts with the exterior forces, whether it be some mob or gang or whether it be some government. I have often mocked Christians who claim to be persecuted in this country. I have joked many times about the church that complained they were having a home Bible study in North San Diego County, and uh, they claimed that San Diego County was persecuting them because they had a hundred cars parked on the street and people couldn't get into their homes, and they said, you can't do that anymore. They're attacking our religious liberty. It should be fair for us to block these driveways. We're meeting here to read the Bible together. And so, rather than turn the other cheek, Christians tend to just get bright, rosy red and grit their teeth and say, I'm going to show you something. And it really is indicative of our own nation. We are a very litigious country. Everybody wants to be right and have their opinion made known. Has that ever been seen more clearly than on social media today? And so this spirit infects us. It gets inside of us. And we... Every single year in November, we spend time looking at real persecution around the world. Where Christians aren't being hassled because they're blocking my driveway. Christians are being hassled because they have converted from their home religion to Christ. Christians are being persecuted, beaten, tortured, and sometimes killed because of the fact they have become a Christian. Not because they're blocking a driveway or because they got upset at some joke at school or some mean-spirited thing at work. They, they are fending for their very lives because of their faith, because of their love for Christ. And so this church was a church that knew what real persecution was. Imagine if we had somebody in our midst and we knew that just yesterday or last week they had been beaten because somebody found out they had been here with us. Somebody found out that they were gathering with Christians. And we're going to teach them to turn to Christ and betray our, their family or their group or whatever it might be. That's what goes on. That's what was going on here. And so, Paul writes to encourage this church. And he writes to remind them to stay true to their calling, to their testimony. We talked about that last week. That they would be worthy of the great calling of God in verse 11. And also in verse 5, that they would be worthy of the kingdom. And a couple weeks ago, we, we spent time really looking at the vengeance of the Lord on behalf of his people. The, the sinful world around us. The sinful world that has attacked the church for 2,000 years. The, the gates of hell that have threatened God's people since Christ ascended to glory. One day, the sinful world will pay. The Lord will make things right. As, as Paul poetically puts it, those who have troubled you, God will trouble them. Those who have harmed you, God will harm them. 
those who come against you, God will come against them. And he will take vengeance. Notice how verse 8 of chapter 1, flaming fire is the kind of vengeance that the Lord brings. He will come down from heaven with his mighty angels as we saw in verse 7. So we see Paul speaks to these people and he says, hang on to your witness. You know, exemplify and be worthy of that great and wonderful calling in the gospel by which you have been called to Christ. Represent his kingdom right on the in the world. But also don't forget, as you suffer, God will make those who have hurt you. God will pay them back for what they have done to you. So there's comfort, there's encouragement, and there's also a reminder that one day, that things won't always go along as they do. Right? One day God's going to intervene, he's going to break in to this world, and he will bring justice with him for his people. And so in chapter 2, Paul comes to the main point of his letter. Now, brethren, concerning the coming, the arrival, the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our gathering together to him. Remember in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul spoke about the coming of the Lord and how he would catch his people up to be with him and how we would be with the Lord forever. And so once again, he speaks in similar terms. Let me remind you about things which apparently you have confused, you've been deceived about, you have forgotten about, you're unsure about. Let me remind you, let me comfort you about the coming of the Lord. He says, we ask you, Remember, it's Paul, Silas, and Timothy gathering together to write this letter. So we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, and as if from us, as though the day of Christ or the day of the Lord had already come. Sometimes we, we have seen sort of the perversion of the gifts of the Spirit in church where people claim to have a, a word from the Spirit and they speak forth, thus says the Lord. And sometimes those things don't mesh well with Scripture. So Paul says, remember what I told you and don't be troubled because you heard something in the Spirit given to you. Be careful about that. Make sure you weigh the Scripture together, the truth of God together. Make sure you remember what I taught you and don't be carried away by the scary things that somebody else might have told you. And he says, or by word, you know, maybe somebody has brought some word to you. Hey, I have a word from the Lord, let me share it with you. Or maybe apparently there was a letter. Now Paul would write letters to his churches. Here a letter comes, perhaps uh, forged in the name of Paul, as it says, as if it was something from us, as if we had written it. Don't be troubled, don't be shaken, as though the day of Christ had already come. And that would be scary. Uh, I grew up in the aftermath of the uh, original Left Behind movies uh, called Thief in the Night, A Distant Thunder, and Mark of the Beast, way back there, late 70s, early 80s. And the last thing you ever wanted to happen was to be left behind when Jesus came. You didn't want to be left behind to suffer the judgment of God to fall. And so it is a scary thing to think you have missed the whole point of your salvation. The whole point that you came to the Lord was to be saved from your sins, to be spared the consequences of your sins. And then somebody comes along and says, you missed it. You've been left behind with the sinners and God's coming to judge the sinners and you're going to get judged. That is a scary thing indeed. But he says, let no one deceive you by any means, no matter how it comes, no matter what form it takes, do not be deceived. And I think the inherent lesson here, as I think often we have shared in this church, is we need to know God's word. We need to know the scripture. We need to know the truth so that we can distinguish it from the lie. If we are fuzzy on the truth, it, it's amazing how people on social media, even people in a church or people uh, on some sort of a, you know, a Facebook or Twitter and all of this, YouTube, they, they creep into your sphere of influence 
they have this thing that sounds so intriguing and oh they're using some bible verses and next thing you know you're being deceived into some misinformation you're, you're being deceived from the truth of the word of god and paul says don't be deceived and the only way for that to be true in your life the only way for that to be true in my life and in this church is if we commit ourselves to knowing the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The Word of God is the truth of God given to us that we can know His truth and then live by His truth. That His truth should be the standard. But if we don't know that standard, well, people come in, they have some Bible verses, they start twisting the scriptures, and it sounds like the case they are making makes sense because we just don't know the truth well enough. So they're able to use a little bit of God's word to bring in their corrupt doctrine. But Paul says, as we see other scriptures tell us the same thing, don't be deceived. Don't be set up for failure in your Christian life because you're neglecting the word of God. Don't neglect the word of God. Don't neglect the people of God. Don't neglect the truth of God. Know it so that you will be prepared to stand in it to stand by it, to stand on it. Like Paul says to the Ephesians there at the very end of his letter, having done all to stand, being prepared with the armor of God, which in short is the scripture, his truth, by being prepared in the scripture and in God's truth, you will be able to stand, and having done all to stand, you will stand. But yet what do we see in our world, in our time, in our churches? People falling away left and right. The roaring lion of the devil. He's just picking people off easy. Look at these people. They don't know the scripture. They don't know what they believe. They don't certainly know why they believe it. They don't even know why they go to church. So here, he's too tired. He's too busy. She's got things on her mind. And next thing you know, the church is the least of our priorities. The scripture is the least of our interests. We're no longer yearning for that spiritual milk. And we begin to atrophy in our spiritual lives, and the devil pounces. We should not be deceived by any means. Four, that day will not come unless the apostasy, the falling away, comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Who opposes and exalts who, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God reminiscent of course of the words of Jesus when he said when you see the abomination which brings desolation there in the temple run for your lives so the question is, do we interpret this in that Jewish context that Jesus seemed to indicate? Is the temple here that Paul speaks about, the, the Jewish temple uh, that Jesus spoke about? Jesus was there at the temple. He says, oh, you think this looks beautiful? It's all crumbling. It's all going to fall. It's all going to be destroyed. Let me tell you what's going to happen. You can read more about that in the Gospels, specifically Matthew 24. But whatever... Paul is exactly getting at. The people who read this letter, the, the things that Paul speaks about, they had heard about. The, these were contemporary type events, just a couple of hundred years before the time of Christ. Antiochus IV, who called himself Epiphanes, he was God in the flesh. He took his armies into Jerusalem, and he conquered the people, committed great atrocities in the city, and ultimately walked into the temple and took a pig and slew it there in the very Holy of Holies. Or slew it on the altar and then brought its blood into the Holy of Holies to mock the temple. In the year 40, right around the time of this Thessalonian letter, Caligula had had his statue placed in the temple area. A few years after this, Pompey would march himself personally into the Holy of Holies to desecrate it. So these words, these words were history, and these words from the time they were written would be even prophetic. 
dangerous, evil men, sons of perdition, men of sin, rebels against God, who oppose the things of the true and living God, who exalted them, exalted themselves above all that is called God, the true God, the living God. The people who read this letter understood these kind of this kind of imagery, and like I also said, it also. Uh, re reminds me of Jesus' own words about the end of days, about the things that would take place at the end. Do you not remember, verse 5, that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only that which is now restraining will do so until it is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So Paul says, look, the mystery of lawlessness, the mystery of all that is against the law of God, and against the truth of God, and against the standard of God. It's at work in the world. And we're unsure exactly what this restraining force is. Often I've heard it said to be the, the Holy Spirit who restrains evil, and that could very well be. That makes, I think, sense here, that God is restraining evil. I think we see that God is in control, and that Men could be more evil than they are, and yet God seems to restrain even the evil of men. But one day, God's going to take his hand off, and he's going to set the world up for its final judgment. And that which is represented by sin and rebellion by God uh, against God will be judged strongly by God, by the very breath of his mouth. Seems to remind me of Revelation 19, the brightness of his coming as he rides in with ten thousands of his saints, as Jude says. And so we see this apocalyptic imagery. We see this frightening and terrifying sequence of events of sinners mocking God, opposing God, exalting themselves against all that is God. And I can't help but see, perhaps, maybe another application that would be important, especially for our day. Three times Paul refers to the temple of God as believers, as Christians, as the church. And I can't help but sort of see, especially in our own day, and even church history shows us similar events, where people within the temple of God, within the church, rise up against God, do horrible things in the name of God lead churches and people astray. Church history is full of cultic behavior, people leading people astray and splitting churches and creating false doctrine and carrying on and, and perverting everything that is righteous and true. Perverting everything that is truly representative of God. And they seem to make themselves God as people follow after them. And this sort of goes along with 1 John, who speaks about that spirit of antichrist that creeps into the church. So whatever exactly Paul is talking about, I think that the general understanding is clear. This sinful world is heading for a collision with God. And the collision will end with God's victory. There's, there's not a doubt here of, hey, will the world and its unholy hordes strengthen themselves against God and will there be sort of an equal wrestling match? Well, there won't be. When God is through, when that restraining force is removed, he will set the world up just like he set up Pharaoh. Just as God hardened Pharaoh's heart and brought him to the Red Sea so that he could drown him and his mighty armies in the water, so will God one day do to this evil and wicked world world and its rulers. And Revelation reminds us God will not just take judgment and vengeance upon the human powers, but also against the spiritual powers in wicked places 
that are working things behind the scenes, God will judge completely and thoroughly so that his truth will prevail and his peace will be eternal. But Paul's not done. It gets a little worse here before it gets better. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, like we were just mentioning, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. It reminds me of 1 Corinthians, I think it's the end of chapter 1, where he talks about those who are perishing and those who are being saved. Those who are being put in a place of death and those who are being put in a place of life. There are only two types of people in this world. The Jews separated people by Jew and Gentile. Christians separate people by the saved and the unsaved. Those who are perishing by those who are living and shall live. By those who have, will be eternally damned with those who will be eternally rewarded by their master in heaven. And so, notice what it says here. Regarding those who are perishing. Regarding the lost who are in rebellion against God. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they might believe the lie. Oh, now that is frightening. It reminds me of Romans chapter 1, of the reprobate that God sets up for judgment, where God hardens their heart. It reminds me again of Pharaoh, where God hardens their heart. It reminds me of that Old Testament story where God says, where is an evil lying spirit that will go and deceive this king and lead him into my judgment? Now, this doesn't always fit into our cookie cutter little box that we like to put God in. This is a frightening thing to see God sovereign over the affairs of men. Sovereign over the hearts of men. Sovereign over the salvation and the damnation of men. That God, our God, would send people a delusion that they should believe the lies which they love. He hands them over, as Paul says in Romans. Why does he do this? So that they may be condemned, and rightly so. Because they did not believe the truth. But where was their pleasure? Where was their delight? Where was their joy? It was not in the Lord Jesus. It was not in the scriptures of truth. It was not in the true and the living God. No, they had pleasure in unrighteousness. These people are not placed in an unfair uh, seat of judgment. They are rather handed over to that which their heart desires. Their heart is not after God. Their heart is after unrighteousness. So these are sinners justly condemned in their sin. Just as Pharaoh justly condemned in his sin. We see God here exercising his power, his authority, and his sovereignty over all creation, and specifically here over the affairs of men. And it harkens back to chapter 1. I mean, notice how strongly Paul is presenting God really is in control. When you suffer, when you're persecuted, looks like the church is being crushed by Satan. Well, let me flip the coin and show you the other side. God really is in control. And this is why the apostles in the book of Acts could do something that I think Americans, Westerners find ridiculous. They could rejoice in their suffering. In fact, they would say silly things like, we are so glad that Jesus looked down on us and he said, these people are worthy to suffer for me. How he could say to Ananias, speaking about the Apostle Paul, I will show Paul, I will show him how much he himself must suffer for me myself and for my name. And the apostles were glad for this suffering. Why were they glad? Because it's all ordained by their God and to be used by God for his purposes, what is the what higher purpose could there be for any human being but for a human who has found their salvation in Christ and who has found Yahweh to be the true and the living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, yet lives 
and he has sent his son to rule and to reign. What better thing than to be used for his purposes? And if it includes suffering, Lord Jesus, I thank you. You counted me worthy. You counted me worthy. You counted me worthy. That I could be true and faithful to your name, even under the worst of circumstances. Like the testimony of the man we saw last week, who went through a brutal uh, time in his life as his wife was diagnosed with a chronic and terminal and brutal and slow-moving illness. And yet he testifies of Christ. And he says, I have found joy like I know I could not have found under any other circumstance except this horrible circumstance that we went through. He has that spirit, that apostolic spirit. Thank you, Lord, for counting me worthy to suffer this for your name's sake. And it just shows, right? These people, Paul the Apostle's message here is that the glory of Jesus is the most important thing. It is truly our end and our purpose to bring glory to the Savior who died for us. This is it. And so let us be convicted, as I so often am, too often, I'm sure, when we mumble and murmur because of our slight infirmities. Let us truly steal ourselves in Christ that we could be worthy of something of substance, something true, so that when the big things hit our life, because we haven't been moping over the molehills, when we have to climb the mountain, we have been strengthened, and we will be faithful, and he will see us through and we, will, we can then be a great testimony to those around us. And so we'll continue in verse 13 next week. But let us be comforted, let us be encouraged. No matter what you see out in the world, no matter what you see coming against God's people, Jesus is on the throne. And his coming, don't you like how Paul describes it? His coming will be a bright and shining coming. And evil will be vanquished. The darkness will be dissipated because of the brightness of the morning star, Christ, when he arrives on this earth. With that, let us pray.